So, I mean, I, I wrote this book, The Heretics Guide to Global Finance. That's kind of, so I guess my current designation is I'm an author, but I mean, I don't know, that's not really a job, but it's not really something you can do full time. It's not really, you know, it, it, you have to do other stuff to become an author in a way. Um, so actually what I do most of the time is um, I work for campaign groups um, on campaigns related to the financial sector. Um, I also, so, so currently I'm working with ActionAid um, on stuff to do with tax justice. I work with the World Development Movement, which is another London group, um, on some of their campaigns. Um, this is kind of part-time in the background. Um, and then, uh, yes, yeah, so I do journalism as well. Um, strangely enough, I also am currently teaching design students at the Camberwell College of Art on um, power dynamics and design. I mean, I don't know how I came to be doing that. It's kind of like one of these things. Um, and then I'm sort of setting up a, a thing called the London School of Financial Activism, which is kind of a, a group to help campaigners or and other members of the public to sort of think about the financial sector um, and think about campaigning on the financial sector. So that's like a whole bunch of stuff I'm kind of, I kind of do. Um, Oh, well, so, uh, <clears throat> I'm not going to talk much about the book itself. I mean, if you guys want to chat to me afterwards about the, the more, de the, the book is, it covers a lot of stuff. I mean, I actually worked in the financial sector, so I have, there's quite a lot of stuff around trying to demystify what actually goes on in the financial sector. Um, there's a lot of stuff on financial activism, which is sort of techniques for campaigning on the financial sector. And then there's a, there's a whole section on alternative finance, which is kind of like more um, building alternatives. Um, which is a lot which sort of transition town and these, these groups are, are very interested in. Um, so, but, so, so that, that's the book. I'm not going to, I won't dwell on that now. Um, one thing I should, I should say is I'm not actually an expert on permaculture. Uh, I'm kind of hoping that there's some people here who, who know a lot about permaculture and can actually maybe help inform some of my thinking because I spent a lot of time in London with the, the sort of Let's say the, the financial policy uh, reform kind of uh, scene, if there's such a thing, um, and a lot of that's a lot of that's very sort of focused on day-to-day -day kind of like uh, trying to change policy and regulation. They often don't have time to reflect on sort of more philosophical takes on, on stuff. So it's quite good if I can bring more of that into that 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 scene. So I always like to hear about um, people's perspectives on this kind of stuff. Um, my actual, my, my first experience with permaculture was actually my aunt in Zimbabwe. Uh, she, she started designing, uh, her and my uncle built their own house, um, where they built it all out of stuff that they found around the, the, their environment. And it was it's just an amazing house. It ended up getting taken away. But they, they, uh, uh, she designed this whole thing so that, you know, she would release water from her bath and it would kind of flow down these channels and, um, uh, uh, watered various trees and so on, and there's this incredible kind of like interaction and sort of, and I remember this was like way back in time, and I, I remember being very impressed by this concept, and that's the first time I sort of heard about permaculture. She was doing all this like mulching and stuff in a garden and things. Um, so I've known about the concept for a while, um, but I mean maybe uh, I should go back a bit into, into sort of my, my, my past because it's, it's, it's quite, it, it informs a lot of stuff of, of how I approach things. Um, so on the one hand, I've worked in the financial sector, but my actual kind of like, if you wanted to say, say like the core of what, where I'm coming from in a lot of my work is, you might roughly call it like deep ecology. Um, if that, I'm not sure that's necessarily the, the correct term. Um, but a lot, a lot of the way I see the world is in terms of not technically making distinctions between humans and other creatures. And that to me is kind of the, and actually so, so perceiving humans as being continuous with other life forms and then actually perceiving life itself to be continuous with non-life, so like other things. And, that's, uh, and there's lots of ways you can arrive at that position. You, know, you might do it through evolutionary biology or something. You, know, you can come to that position through that, like, or whatever. There's, there's, um, in my case, I came to that position probably because I grew up in, in a sort of family which, uh, I don't know, maybe, you know, I spent a lot of time in, South, in the, kind of the wilderness in South Africa. I kind of like... Uh, Always, always associated and identified with it and spent lots of time, say so like my dad would take me out into the mountains and we would uh, go sleep out in caves up in the, up in the, the high mountains of the Joachensburg in South Africa. So you know, we'd, you'd hike for 15 kilometers and then just sleep out in these places. So I, I always had this kind of affinity for this kind of stuff. And um, in a way that's kind of my original identity. 
Uh, look, people always think of me nowadays as being this like financial person, which is interesting. Um, and uh, so I actually had, had a, uh, I spent like, uh, I was an obsessive bird watcher for a long time. I've seen about a third of South Africa's bird species, which is, it's about a thousand of them. So there's this, it's a fairly decent, uh, um, uh, I, I'm not sure if any of you are here bird watchers in, in the UK. It's a whole different scene because all the birds are like gray and stuff. You can't really tell the difference. Uh, South Africa's bird watching has got like a whole different kind of vibe to it. Um, <laughs> So I should, I should get into the UK bird watching scene as well. Um, anyway, so uh, maybe one last point on, on that like, deep ecological outlook, because this, this actually is uh, still how I think about the financial sector. The, the, probably the most profound moment for me was when I was, I was working in the, sort of, uh, the, the rural part of South Africa. This is when I was, I was left university. And um, I, was, I was working in this, this backpacker's lodge, and uh, I used to go up in the mornings and look out over the sea. And I could see the curvature of the earth from up where there's this section where you, where you could sit up in the, up in the and you can, only, you, can, you can only really do it on the coastline, which is really interesting. And, and being able to see the curvature of the earth really changes your entire perspective and everything. Uh, a lot of people in cities can never see the curvature. So you never really perceive yourself as being part of a, of a rolling planet. Um, and another thing that's, that you start doing in that situation is you stop perceiving the, that the sun rises. You actually more perceive that the earth kind of like dips over. And so the sun just sits there and you kind of like have the sense of like rolling um, in space, which is this really like quite profound thing if you, um, I mean, it's possible that, I mean, I'm, I might have been high or something at that time, I don't know, but like, uh, you, you don't need to be, you don't need to be to, to, to experience that sense of um, like, maybe what you want to call it, some kind of like work, uh, uh, oneness or something with, with uh, the rest of, of uh, but not in kind of like a kitsch way where you think that all the like creatures like love you and stuff, you kind of like have this sort of sense of like, this is an interacting system. You know, you can see the dolphins, you can see what they're doing. They don't necessarily have any idea you're sitting on the hill and they don't necessarily care, but you can understand there's some kind of continuity in this whole process. Um, so uh, that's kind of like uh, how I, uh, that's my sort of past in a way. And strangely enough, I then worked in what many people consider to be the polar opposite of that, which is the financial sector. Um, kind of like brutal concrete and electronic, trading and all these things which are so alien to that kind of kind of mindset um, and in terms of what I actually was doing in the financial sector I worked as a derivative a derivatives broker if you uh, to put that in very basic terms this means you help people enter into giant bets with each other that's basically it it's like it's kind of like a high street bookie except just much bigger um, that's kind of what the derivatives world is uh, uh, and I guess, so that's, that's probably enough about my past. Like, and so, so, so thinking about those things, whenever I'm thinking about the financial sector, I'm always trying to put it in an ecological context. So even, and I guess when I'm working with campaign groups, I'm always trying to stress this. Um, in a lot of the discourse of campaign groups, there's often this assumption that the financial sector is somehow separate from the ecological systems or something. It's like, it's like oh, it's just trading and paper and electronics, it's got nothing, it's not connected at all to anything. And I think this is like a fundamentally like wrong point. Like it, everything in the financial sector at some basic fundamental level always goes back to ecological systems. Even in your most abstract hedge funds, the people who work in those hedge funds rely on agricultural systems. The electricity they use relies on fossil fuels. Um, everything, the shares that they trade in are conduits into companies, which in turn are conduits into assets in the real world. They are, at some level, eventually always extracting value from the natural world, regardless of what they're doing. Um, and that kind of realization makes you sort of think of it in a more kind of an organic way. You start to not perceive the financial sector as somehow being this alien thing. It's kind of like it's more. Uh, 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 and then the, so the key question that comes into that then is, is the system fundamentally um, undermining that natural system, or is it working in accordance with it? And I think most people here probably have a sense that the financial sector is parasitic, or at least um, not a good influence on, our, on that, that system that it's part of. Um, so that's kind of a backdrop. Um, so let me go into permaculture then. So, so what I like about permaculture, and I'm, again, I'm not, I'm not presuming to be, there's probably many different strands of permaculture, and I don't want to like, uh, be dogmatic about this. But one of the things I quite like about the, the concept of permaculture is people, um, it, it, it's, it's very different to your sort of, at least in my mind, the kind of fortress mentality environmentalism, which is kind of like, uh, 
Humans are not part of, are, are somehow, somehow separate to, the, to nature. And then we protect those in kind of like fortresses and we can kind of go look at it. And then you can sort of, you sort of perceive yourself as being separate. Um, and so it's sort of, kind of your, the very conservation mentality where you don't want people to actually enter those areas um, to actually obtain resources and obtain things like that. Um, I, what I always like about sort of the more permacultural mindset is trying to think about yourself as part of that system and saying there's not necessarily anything inherently wrong with obtaining yields from natural systems. The point is how you go about doing it and how you, you keep the balance. Um, so if you think about, say, the financial system, it is in, it's in many ways it's a system of extracting resources. Um, there's nothing inherently wrong about the idea of extracting resources. It's whether you're the way that you extract resources is done in a sustainable and also sort of regenerative way, uh, such that you don't undermine yourself in the process. Um, so actually many sort of straightforward financial products as it were could theoretically be made to actually fit within ecological constraints if they were designed correctly. So that's kind of a, a meta point. Um, so let me uh, go into a couple examples. I'm not going to have time to go into you know, every kind of aspect of the financial system, so I thought I'd pick out a few, a few things. Um, a recent example I was thinking about is this issue of payday lending. I'm not sure in Totnes if it's a particularly big issue, but where I am in South London, this issue of payday lending, which is basically an incredibly high interest loan um, for poorer people in society. Uh, so if you have these payday lenders, they lend money at extremely high rates. Um, and of course the problem is people go, and, buy, people go and, and borrow money and the kinds of people who are borrowing very, very low amounts of money are not the kind of people who you want to be paying high amounts of interest because they're the people who are least able to pay high amounts of interest. So by its very definition, payday lending is parasitic. The very people it relies on to make its money are the, the people who are, the, who, the, who are in the worst position to actually pay that kind of stuff back. Um, so, and I've tried to get payday loans before as well. I mean, I work freelance and I've, I always constantly have like issues with cash flow. Um, there's been many times when I've been really incredibly broke and there's, I've been to payday loans people before. Um, and I've actually seen people in those places literally pleading at the desk, asking because they've, they've borrowed say 200 pounds and then they say, oh, and then they, they, I can't pay back the, 25 pounds interest that they have to pay back at the end of the two week period. Um, or they borrow 400 pounds and they have to pay back 500 pounds at the end of the month. And then, so, and then the people will, will refuse that loan, so what's gonna happen? They go to another payday lender and they ask to borrow money so they can pay back those guys and they get to pay back more. And eventually the payday lenders themselves won't actually lend them, so they'll go to the back alley loan sharks who are even worse than the payday lenders. So there's this whole kind of cycle of, of poverty that kind of gets in there. Um, and you can see that's an inherently, uh, it's under, it paid a low, those, types of, those types of institutions are trying to, in a sense, uh, uh, they're parasitic upon the communities that they're part of. They don't regenerate anything in the communities. They, they extract, purely, they purely just extract. Um, so if you're trying to think about, uh, and I suppose if you want to get an analogy with a sort of like ecological systems, you would, you would think about and I, I, I view human systems as ecological systems, but in a more traditional sense, you know, kind of like natural systems. Um, uh, let's, let's say, yeah, so I, I, I think the example that I used in, in, the, in the piece I did for the, the transition uh, press was uh, around fisheries. You know, there's this whole thing of um, if you overfish a river, it's, it might be uh, pro profitable in the short term. You might be able to extract a very high yield in the short term, but what you're going to basically do is you're going to screw yourself over in the longer term. So in order for that ecosystem to stay healthy, you basically, the, only, the, the amount of yield you can take out of it has to be kept at a cap so that the fish can regenerate themselves. And not only that, so you can have the actual ecosystem working properly. So if all the fish disappear, all your other species are gonna disappear as well because the whole system's gonna be put into a system of imbalance. Um, so this is a very similar kind of thing with payday loans in a way. In a way, you, they arrive in a community, extract as much as you can, and then kind of like when it all falls apart, you just dis you disappear. So um, a, sort of a counter example of this, which builds in, say, permacultural principles, um, which there's probably lots of examples of, of this kind of thing, but a, a particular a good example is a, is a group in, San, uh, in Santa Fe called the Permaculture Credit Union. Um, 
And actually, credit unions in general are thinking about this issue in a sort of permacultural way. They're thinking, okay, so we're offering a service, we, we're lending to people, but we don't want to extract so much out of the system that the system's going to collapse. We want to basically build up the capacity of the people that we're lending to, because that's going to be in everyone's mutual interest in the long term. Um, besides the fact that it's also a horrible thing to bankrupt people. Um, there's a sense of we all benefit if we actually don't extract too much out of the system. It's a much better longer-term strategy. Um, so the permaculture credit union is an interesting one to look at. And credit unions in general have this sort of, this sort of ethos, and they, they, they sort of, I guess, trying to build up relations with local people, trying to work on their credit scores, think about, you know, how do you, are you actually able to pay this back? Let's put you in touch with other people so you're more able to pay it back, and so on. So the whole, the whole ethos is around how do we increase the productive capacity of the system such that actually we, we improve the resilience of the system. And that's you know, fundamentally a kind of a permacultural principle, you know, you extracting something, but you also, you're not extracting so much that you're undermining the system. Um, and payday lending in a way is kind of like a, a quite an overt, obvious example of this kind of thing, but you know, lending in general has this element to it. Uh, so even sort of mainstream house, house street lending, but mortgages and so on, um, it might not take the immediate appearance of being overtly parasitic. Actually, also people will say, hey, I've got a mortgage, somebody lent me this money, you know, it's, it's fine, you know, it's kind of, um, or you know, whatever they've bought, borrowed money for. It doesn't necessarily immediately take the form of something that's like, actually like uh, uh, undermining you. But collectively, the debt system has a long-term effect of undermining ecological stability. So it might not be in your face straight away, but there's actually very little, um, and actually you might have a very friendly bank manager who's actually you know, a perfectly nice person and so on, but actually they're always within those constraints. They, they're forced with, within that system to be always considering, there's a boundary on how nice they can be effectively. Um, they can be a nice up to the, as long as it, they can continue to extract value. So, and if past that point, you can't. So those, those institutions are, are fundamentally wired to be extracting value from people in the short term. Um, so the general debt system um, might be very good for boosting society's overall economic growth, but it does so at the expense of long-term resilience. And a lot of people have this sense when you, in sort of ecological economics, uh, the sense of like, oh, there's, there's a lot of like uh, economic growth has been created by the success of lending all the place. You know, you're, you're building up businesses, you're building up all these things, but at the same time, you're doing it, um, uh, you're fundamentally um, overshooting the actual ability of your, of your ecological system to regenerate itself in the process. So it's, it's short-sighted. Um, going back to your kind of permaculture responses to this, a lot of the kind of local banking advocates um, advocates much smaller, much more local banks as a kind of like response to this, um, where you're lending directly into a community um, and you're, you're trying to build up local resilience and you're trying to think about your, your um, natural carrying capacities. And a lot of your, your kind of free marketeers are always saying, you know, oh, this, is, this is really slow, it's really kind of like, uh, takes, it doesn't promote economic growth, but this is the whole point. The whole point about actually creating a resilient system is that you actually do have to do it slowly. You have to do it in keeping with the actual boundaries. Um, th by nature, fast growth suggests you haven't paid attention to the actual constraints um, or it's happening at the expense of something which is kind of come back to bite you. So this, this, this argument that you get slower growth by much smaller scale financing at a local level, um, well, it's true. That, and that should be the case, in a way. If you actually want a longer-term resilience in, in a system, you have to do that. Um, so if you're designing it in a permaculture way, that's, that's kind of a, something you'd build in. Is that kind of making sense so far? Okay. I'm not going to go on about debt right now. We can talk more about that in the, the discussion. Um, so let me st uh, step back. Mm. So permaculture is characterized by all these uh, people who who studied this, these, these design principles, the 12 design principles of permaculture. Um, so, and I, I'm not going to rattle through them now, but like, uh, actually many of them are sort of aspects of each other. They're kind of like, they're, they're not necessarily, they're, they're not really standalone principles. They're kind of, 
they sort of imply each other in a way. Um, do you guys know about the 12 principles of permaculture at all? Is, okay. Um, we can go through maybe in the discussion session more of them, but I mean, now there's, there's, they're basically kind of like ecological, uh, anybody who's, who understood how an ecology would work would sort of basically understand these principles. It's like, you know, diversity is a good thing, you know, um, uh, try and, uh, when times are good, you know, to try and store stuff. Uh, so that you can use it when times are bad. And those, those sort of quite sort of fundamental, pretty straightforward practical principles that anybody who's actually aware of how systems work would probably work out intuitively. Um, so, uh, but, but the first one, which I think is probably the most important one, for me at least, is this, this, this sort of first principle of permaculture is observe and interact. Um, and I'm going to... Uh, the. In, in a way, this, this, if you wanted to phrase this in, in social sciences term, you probably might call it say, say like a human system, anthropology, you know? Observing how, you know, so, so it, 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 if you're in a, in a, in a, in a natural system, it's, it, you call it like ecology, and, you know, but you know, if you're sitting in a town, observing and interacting basically means you're watching what people are doing. You know, you're um, experiencing life, you're, you're trying to think about it. And, um, and so that's basically what we call anthropology. Um, and actually, and there's another term for it in anthropology called participant observation. And I studied anthropology, so this is kind of like, well, I know. Participant observation is when you're watching something, but you're also participating, a.k.a. you're observing and you're interacting at the same time. Okay, so you're just getting a sense for something, and you're also kind of like then also thinking about what's happening. Um, so in this room right now, I could, I could probably give a whole bunch of principles that are going on. Uh, for example, everyone's looking at me, you know, this, and it's a strange thing. It's like we have, a, we, we have a formalized structure in society which says if somebody stands up in front, you're supposed to kind of like defer your attention to the person, um, and other people will start to shun you if you were sort of having your own conversation across there. There's, there's, these are rules that occur in social situations, um, which we mostly don't ever think about. Um, but, and they're there for good reason as well, you know. <laughs> so, uh, although I hope you will interact. <laughs> later. Um, so so, so this, this observe and interactive is crucially important for a financial system. If you, if you want to actually, so we think about the other, say the payday loan example. I mean, it's clear that the, that the people who run these, these types of operations honestly don't have any idea how the communities work and only that they don't actually care often. Um, so if you were ever trying to design a particular intervention into an economic system, you would have to spend a lot of time uh, exploring it, thinking about it. I spend a lot of my time when, I, when I'm walking around London like just watching people, what they do. So you go down to the sort of little back alleys of, of Brixton and stuff and you can see stuff going on. You can see these informal systems of exchange occurring. You see this whole like um, informal remittance systems which exist, um, say based on Islamic principles that nobody knows about. So that, they, uh, that they're going on without, uh, you know, people walk past this stuff all the time. And it's, if you just sit and watch for a while, you can see these things happening. So if you ever try to design an intervention into that system, you've got to be very aware of those dynamics. You can't just sort of throw um, some kind of idea into community and expect it to just take off without understanding how the community actually interacts with, with themselves. Um, of course, mainstream banks are very well known for not paying any attention whatsoever to how a community actually behaves. So the bank comes and just plonks itself down anywhere. If the community doesn't like what the bank does, the bank just goes away. So we have what in the UK people will call unbanked communities or financial exclusion. Financial exclusion is a situation where a bank just says, you don't want what we have, so we're just going to go. We're not gonna even going to be here. Or, you know, we're going to give you something and you're just going to take it. So there's no form, there's no system of interaction, there's no actual thinking about what people actually need or what, what they want. Um, maybe I'm being slightly harsh. I mean, there are times when banks try to like, tap into what people are actually doing. Um, but, you know, your bar, a Barclays, anywhere, Barclays across the country offer exactly the same products. They don't try to change it depending on the community. Um, so, and actually, even in the alternative economic space, among your alternative finance practitioners, this is a problem. There's a lot of people who, int who introduce alternative economic systems without actually thinking about the communities. Um, this is a big issue in alternative currencies, for example. I spend a lot of time with the alternative currency community. Um, actually, I was doing, I was doing a, a, a workshop in, at a festival a few, a few months ago where I was like, hey, the, the workshop was like, let's create a pop-up currency for the festival, right? Um, what should the currency be? 
And the first thing everyone threw out was this was like, uh, oh, we should create a local currency for the, for the, for the festival, shouldn't we? Uh, it was Shambhala Festival. So let's create a local Shambhala, uh, which is an amazing festival, by the way. Um, let's create a this local currency for this festival. Um, and they'd all, they'd all be thinking about the Brixton Pound. Um, and I don't know if you guys know the Brixton Pound, but it's a local currency, a bit similar to the, to the Totnes Pound. Um, so uh, I, I use the Brixton Pound a lot. Uh, and, and I was like, well, why would people at Shambhala Festival want to use a local currency? Uh, the thing about the Brixton Pound is the point of the Brixton Pound is that the problem in Brixton is that all the money leaves Brixton, so it doesn't get spent in the local shops, right? So, so if, you, if you're designing an intervention, you think, okay, this may be a way to try and concentrate the economic energy into that area, which would otherwise be leaving. In the situation of Shambhala Festival, though, people are locked into an area. They can't do anything else but engage in economic interactions in the Shambhala Festival. They, by default, is a local economy. So you don't need an alternative local currency in that situation. So if you want to introduce a local currency, you've got to think about, OK, well, maybe it shouldn't be a commercial currency. Maybe it's something else. What are people in this situation, what are they, are they lacking, which they have come here for, which they can't actually obtain? So perhaps you'll be thinking more about some kind of skill exchange or some kind of like, you know, people go to festivals to have fun or to meet people. So maybe you could design something which helped them do that. They're not going to a festival to engage in commerce. So, uh, so this kind of thing, like if, if you actually spent a few a little while th uh, so watching people at Shambhala, you would kind of come to that conclusion. And that's a basic kind of observe and interact principle. Um, does that kind of make sense? <laughs> So that, yeah, that's, that's kind of like, I guess, where, uh, a, a good um, permacultural meta point. Another really big thing, I'm not going to go talk much, much longer on this. Let me try to get uh, two more sort of broad points. Um, another um, a, a key sort of permacultural design principle is, is appreciating diversity uh, and seeking diversity as part of a system. Um, and actually, if you, if you go to any sort of alternative economics type events now, nowadays, um, and, even, and even sort of quite mainstream economic events, there's a big theme coming out now, which is trying to increase diversity. Um, let's say in the banking sector, this is big, if you've got all these events, they're talking about let's increase the diversity in the banking sector. Let's introduce more competition. Let's uh, add more local banks. Um, this to me is a fundamentally positive move. Uh, so I mean, if you think about the financial system as it is right now, uh, there's, it's a highly concentrated system. It has a very, um, you could perhaps call it a monoculture. It's a very, there's a single type of finance you can engage with. Um, and as anybody who studies monocultures knows, the problem with a monoculture is that while it might be very effective at a certain type of thing, it's also very susceptible to being taken down by individual factors. So one of the key concepts behind the idea of diversity being a good thing is resilience. In terms of you have diversity in a system, if one thing goes down, you kind of have the ability to, to rely on something else. So the one parameter of diversity is a kind of a conservative impulse almost, which is what, how can we get uh, a situation where we're safest, as it were? Um, and uh, any kind of sort of cropping systems know this kind of thing. So you don't want to like dump all of your stuff into one, one crop um, if you want true resilience in, the, in, in a system. Um, but there's a kind of a second facet to, 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 to diversity, which is actually creativity. So it has this kind of like, which could be, a, uh, it has a sort of semi-conservative element, but also has a really creative element, um, which is, it's through diversity that you actually get changes in systems. You have, you kind of have interactions, you kind of have uh, a d dynamism in systems. And if you look at the financial sector, um, not only is it a monoculture with no real uh, resilience, but it's also very uncreative, actually. And it's very unresponsive to stuff. Like, there's a big crisis happens and nothing really changes. It sort of just kind of lumbers on in exactly the same way. 
Uh, actually, what you want is, in a system is, is to say, if there was a particular crisis in one part, that kind of part sort of fades away and then new kind of things sort of s s uh, come up and kind of in a sort of semi-evolutionary type fashion. That's kind of how, um, actually if you look, if you study like evolutionary biology, that you'll figure this out. If you don't have diversity in a system, you can't have actual uh, uh, progression in a sense. If everything's the same, you, you have no, no uh, 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 sort of natural selection. Um, so that's maybe not entirely accurate, but, but uh, there's this basic point that actually you want genetic diversity if you want to get um, positive things coming up with that. Um, so let me talk about some potential kind of things which are going on around introducing diversity into the financial sector. Um, so we've already said something about uh, local banking. Uh, two kind of big themes which are coming out right now are peer-to-peer -peer finance. Um, and crowdfunding. Now, to some people, I'm not sure if you guys have ever experienced peer-to-peer -peer finance and crowdfunding. Peer-to-peer uh, -peer finance is basically where you're offering each other financial services. All right, so uh, if, if I was offering you a loan, that would be a peer-to-peer -peer loan. We're giving each other a financial service, or I'm giving you a financial service. Um, so there are all these sort of sites that are coming up now to, to promote peer-to-peer -peer finance. Um, there's also this crowdfunding concept, which is um, basically me raising money from lots of different people. Um, the great thing about these is that while these are very, it's still very sort of nascent type, types of um, uh, innovations, more and more people are becoming aware of them and more and more people are using them. Um, I've actually used crowdfunding before, it's very effective. Um, and the great thing about them is that it's suddenly enabling all sorts of people who were previously excluded from traditional finance to actually obtain financing. In particular, artists, musicians, um, sort of uh, campaigning groups, people who wouldn't fit into your traditional monoculture notion of something you can extract pure value out of, which the mainstream financial sector works on. Um, so this is definitely on the fringes of introducing a bunch of diversity into, into the system. Um, of course, these are very small amounts, but that's, again, that's the kind of financing that a lot of these people need. You know, if you're making a, an indie film, you don't want massive loans. And that's why a bank will ignore you. Uh, it's not, it can't give you a massive loan. It's not going to make much money out of it. But the, sort of the crowdfunding space taps into a very different dynamic and actually uh, enables you to get that, that financing. Um, so that's a very positive step in, to me in terms of increasing diversity. On the peer-to-peer -peer finance, there's a slightly different element, although these are they're very related. Um, there's a kind of a sense of um, uh, changing the power dynamic of financing. So I, I've kind of taken it for granted that people have a basic sense of what the financial sector is supposed to do. Is that, should, I, should I do like a, a thing about a kind of what it's theoretically supposed to do in society? Okay, I'll take a little, little back step. Um, and then I'll try and talk maybe, uh, yeah. Um, in our, our, your society, in, in effect, you know, people produce things. That's your, your starting point of any economics. You produce stuff. That's what humans do. And actually, other creatures also do this. But humans, at least, we define ourselves by we produce things. Then we may exchange those things. And then we may use the medium of money as a technology to help that exchange process. And then we may consume those things. Um, and those are the kind of like the three layers of economics in my mind at least. I produce something, I might exchange it, and then I consume something, all right? And then the financial sector comes in when you have a surplus of stuff you've produced and um, you've exchanged it and you have a surplus of money and you want to deposit it into the rest of the system or you want to redistribute surplus production into the rest of the system. So if finance fundamentally is predicated on agriculture, because uh, agriculture is how you get surplus production. Prior to agriculture, you don't really get surplus production, as far as I know, at least. At least ma major surplus production in society starts to occur when you have agricultural systems. So finance really kind of like comes out of, that, that, out of, out of this, this idea. Like you have more stuff than you currently need to consume, so you can actually start to redistribute it into other, other activities that other people might, might be able to use it. And this is a kind of a, a slightly devious way of describing the financial sector, because there's a lot of other dynamics there. Um, but in, in essence, it's supposed to help people to redistribute surplus production into investments, which they will then extract a return back from over time. Okay, so in a very basic way, I might do a job for somebody, I obtain resources, as a result, I don't need to use the resources right now, so I use some of that to lend money to somebody else who will put that money into their own production and will give me some of their production back. 
That's a financial circuit, as it were. Um, what's currently happened in our system is that all the process of producing those financial services has been centralized into a bunch of incredibly powerful financial intermediaries that we call banks um, or else funds. There's, there's various you know, investment banks, major funds, pension funds, hedge funds, these centralized intermediaries which um, lock up most of the power and most of, the, most of the, that process into themselves. And so if you think about the diversity aspect, what you're trying to do is you're trying to like deconcentrate that power and take it out into other ways, into sort of other, other um, channels. So going back to our, our point about crowdfunding, crowdfunding is one potential alternative way to steer that, those surplus resources in society. Peer-to-peer um, uh, -peer finance is another one of them. Um, and uh, I guess one of the reasons why you want to think about why this is important, and inherent in permaculture is this kind of sense that like, uh, you want to take care of people as well. There's a sense of uh, what's called people care and earth care. Um, and, and one of the, the, the big sort of, uh, I guess maybe you want to call it spiritual deficits or kind of emotional deficits people have um, in our current system is this sort of sense of alienation. Um, I, you don't really know where stuff comes from and you kind of like, uh, you don't really know why you work or uh, on the one sense you don't really know why you produce things and then you don't really understand where the stuff you consume comes from either. So there's this constant sense of slight bewilderment as to what your actual role in an economic system is. A lot of people don't actually understand that they produce things and then exchange them and consume them. They, they, a lot of people fetishize that exchange process. They imagine like, oh, the reason that I work is that I then exchange it and then I get money so that, that's, the, that's the end goal, isn't it? It's like, no, no, the end goal is, is that you're supposed to stay, stay alive and, and, and try and enjoy your life in some way and try not to like, destroy everything in the process. Um, so people have, have become very kind of confused as to about why you actually engage in an economic system or why they have jobs. Um, so a, a, a lot of this, is kind of this mentality is still remains is partially to do with the kind of disconnection that's introduced by those major intermediaries in a lot of these processes. So a lot of people in society don't even realize that they, they contribute to offering financial services. For example, when they're putting money into banks, or when they're putting their money into a pension fund. They don't even realize that this is a, a way that society continues to um, produce things. So uh, part of the reason why this increased diversity is good is it actually starts to unlock new ways of thinking about yourself when you're engaging in economic life. So not only is it, is it good for diversity of the system and there's ecological benefits we could talk about, but it's also from a psychological perspective, it's good to perceive that you have an option to do something differently, that I don't only have one way to engage with an economic system. So that's a kind of another reason why diversity is psychologically important, I think, for people. Um, but we can debate that maybe. Um, my last point I want to bring out, um, I think I'll start with people 45 minutes, it's kind of like almost 40 minutes now, so I'll do another, um, which I've kind of been hinting at, is the sense of what, one of the overriding concepts in permaculture is like a uh, holism. The sense you, you want holistic systems. Um, if, you're, if, you're approaching, if you're approaching design, uh, design is inherently a, a, a sense of, of what features do you want to build into something in particular. So if I think about the, the design of this phone, um, I could choose to, say, have a, a incredibly fast phone, um, or else maybe a very light phone, or maybe it's a, a very aesthetically beautiful phone or something. There's always kind of parameters which I'm trying to balance when, I, when I'm designing something. Um, if you want the world's fastest phone, maybe you'd actually have to make it bigger, but in which case maybe it's harder to carry around. So you're designing these sort of, there's a lot of trade-offs built into design. Um, uh, when you look at sort of how a lot of economic systems are designed, they're actually designed for only one purpose frequently, which is maximum short-term extraction. And I'm not, this is not necessarily an inherently always a negative thing. Sometimes people need to extract stuff to stay alive, you know? This is like maybe what you want some, sometimes. But when this is fetishized as the only point of any kind of economic existence, uh, maximum extraction, it's clearly a very uh, non-holistic way of designing a system. If you're thinking about actual hol holistic design, you'll be thinking, well, Okay, so you want to be able to survive, and you want to be able to do, do stuff, but, but what are you sacrificing if you, if you, uh, in the process of doing this? How do we, how do we maintain holism? And actually, in particular, the, the biggest problem in much, a lot of economics is, um, maybe I can, uh, David Graeber wrote this great, great article the other day called uh, Bullshit Jobs, that some of you might have read. But the, the basic point is that lots of people are working bullshit jobs, uh, 
so that they can earn money to buy pointless crap that they don't need in order to fulfill the void of working a pointless job. So you have this kind of like self-fulfilling loop of, of dissatisfaction. And the problem is, is that you don't have any satisfaction from your production process in society. You're trying to gain all your satisfaction from the consumption process. So your whole economic system is fetishizing the, the consumption element of economic life. And if you think of yourself as an economic citizen, as it were, it's almost like your job as an economic citizen is to consume things, and that's how you also define your identity as a person. Are you define yourself by what you buy, not by necessarily what you make. This is, not, this is not a hard and fast principle. This is, people are balancing this all the time, but the, the balance has definitely shifted towards a consumption element of, of identity. Um, and what, are, what you're trying to think about when you're doing holistic design is think, okay, how do we get a system where people feel they do something meaningful when they're producing something, but so that they can also get enough resources in the process that you can consume enough to survive? Um, and also, so the exchange process is also not alienating. So you actually can build in communal dynamics into the exchange process. So meaningful production, um, an exchange process that doesn't alienate you, that actually you can interact with people, and then a sort of meaningful consumption as well, things that you actually add value to your life when you're consuming stuff. Um, and that's kind of like you might call like a decent economic system would have those types of things built into it. Um, at least you would hope it would. Um, so a permacultural, uh, any particular kind of, uh, to, to me those would be different elements you're playing off against each other. And if you think about elements of say human psychology that they play into that, um, you have uh, creativity. You, you want to produce stuff that you feel proud of, like you, you, there's a kind of creative aspect there. Uh, there's, a, there's a communal aspect. You want to be able to interact with people in a meaningful way. Um, there's also, uh, uh, you'll your, your, see your biological beings built into it. You have to actually consume stuff to survive. Um, so that there's this, these different types of aspects of yourself that, you, that you're, you're trying to build into that design. Um, uh, and then, of course, there's a sense of you, you as a human as part of a broader ecological system, which is kind of underpins everything else. Um, so, so I guess in terms of potential um, interventions which have been tried to, uh, in this, we're going to talk about alternative currencies. A lot of alternative currencies, part of the sense is, is how do you actually redefine the balance um, in that, that economic system. Um, taking it away from that fetishization of consumption towards actually in introducing more meaning into the exchange process and into what you make. So let's think about time banks, for example. I mean, I, I use time banks. I've sold, my, I've sold three copies of my book on a time bank, actually, which, is, which has been pretty interesting. Um, uh, and for those of you, I've got a South African accent, so when I say time, it often sounds a bit different to the UK. I'm, I'm, I've become aware of this. this um, but time banks, if you think what they're trying to do, they're, they're trying to say, hey, here's an alternative form of exchange, right? It's still an exchange technology, much like uh, your mainstream money is an exchange technology. But it's saying normal money might be very efficient at exchange, but it only does that at the expense of alienating people from each other and, and creating this sort of arm's length atomization of people often. Um, we're going to design an exchange technology which allows you to exchange stuff, but, but in the process, we, we're not going to sacrifice the communal aspect. You're actually going to interact with people as you exchange. Now, this is actually much more inconvenient for many people, but that's, again, going back to this element of design, it's a trade-off that's built into the design of the, of the system. It's like if you can't often have an incredibly efficient system that also has communal dynamics built into it, because com community, by its very definition, often involves a somewhat inefficient process of interacting with each other. Um, you're kind of, I guess, you're, uh, in, 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 some sense, in some sense, your most efficient community would just be a dead community. You know, eh? that, would be, that would be perfect efficiency. You know, nothing ever goes wrong. And some of your, so some of your most rich kind of uh, economies are actually very inefficient. And that's, that's the purpose, the, the point, the, the reason why they're rich is that they are inefficient. So, and you can, this, we can, you, you this really feels when you go into to Tesco and you've got this like generic voice talking out of that box at you and it's trying to pretend to be a human. And you're just like, why are you trying to pretend to be a human? This is a computer talking, you know, let's just, let's just cut through the bullshit and just like take this for what it is. Um, so yeah, that type of exchange has been, has been um, uh, is very clearly a very inhuman form of exchange in a way. Um, so time bank is a type of intervention that's trying to reverse that. But I'm not saying that's without uh, um, its difficulties. I might leave it at that for now. Maybe my last point, which kind of goes back to that, is, is 
um, at the core of a lot of this type of stuff in terms of holism is integrating yourself into the design process. Actually, a lot of activists who I work with, when they're thinking about the financial system and they're, they're kind of ta attacking the financial system, they're often not thinking about themselves. They're, they're, they're imagining themselves as being external from the system and then um, it's out there somewhere and they kind of attack it. And you like, the way I often think about it is that if you want to design an alternative system, you're always going to be thinking about how you yourself actually reflect that system. Um, the very language that you use often reflects that exact power structure. Um, the very way that you use money in society often is actually reflects that broader, that broader problem in society. Um, so uh, if you ever wanted to think about alternative economics and alternative uh, uh, financial systems, you, you should start with yourself and, and sit and think about how you actually use money um, and um, your relationship to it and how, if you extrapolate that out to society as a whole, what that means at a meta level. Um, and you can often see that in the, your own small behaviors that those are, would manifest themselves at that, that major level in an incredibly destructive system. Um, and that becomes a very good way to start, start a design process of thinking about something, something alternative. Um, I'm going to leave it at there because I'm getting tired and going off. Um, I, hope that, I hope that makes basic uh, sense. And, um,